Welcome everyone to the lay member orientation for our 2024 session of the Virginia Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. I know there'll be others that will be joining us throughout uh, this time together and who will uh, watch the recording once it is up on the conference website. This is a busy summer afternoon and so I appreciate everyone's time and attention that can join in today and to all those who will be able to watch uh, before annual conference. Hope the information will be helpful. I'm Martha Stokes. I have the honor and privilege of serving as your conference lay leader. It is a true joy and privilege for me to be in that role and to walk alongside all of you uh, with our annual conference. It seems very appropriate to start this time together by greeting you with the words attributed to the Apostle Paul in the opening verses of uh, the letter to the Philippians. I'm gonna read from the New Revised Standard Version um, of the Bible. So here are these words. Grace to you and peace from God our Creator and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God for every remembrance of you, always in every one of my prayers for all of you, praying with joy for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I'm confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Before we go any further, let me just offer a few reminders, a few of those Zoom etiquette reminders that we all should be used to, but tend to forget every now and then um, as we go along. Since this is a Zoom webinar, uh, you will be able to um, only see and hear the, the presenters, the speakers, not everyone else that's online. If you have a question, please type it into the Q&A feature. Um, the chat feature is not going to be open during this time, but we'll be monitoring those questions um, as we uh, go through. Dwayne Stinson, our Director of Connectional Ministries for Discipleship and Congregational Vitality, is assisting with the Zoom and will be one to help to monitor those questions. As we open our time together this afternoon, I'd like to introduce Rachel Bryant, a member of the youth cohort to the annual conference this year. Rachel is a lay member at large from the Mountain View District. She is from Mount Olivet and Concord Churches in Pennsylvania County. Rachel, will you offer our opening prayer for us? Sure. Let us pray. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you call each of us to be ministers of your gospel and give us the example of your Son, Jesus, that we might know, without a doubt, what that ministry should look like when lived out in the world. As we prepare for our gathering together as United Methodists of the Virginia Annual Conference, kindle in our hearts a love for each other who welcome all of the many and varied gifts of your many and varied people, who seek to transform the world both by being faithful disciples and encouraging others to become disciples of Jesus Christ. Open our hearts fully to the joy of seeing old friends and celebrate with us as we make new ones. Let us feel your Holy Spirit rejoice within us as the blessings of the bonds of friendship compel us to share that same joy with others, especially those who for so long have known only in their hearts the pain of rejection and exclusion. God forgive us for the times when we have been that source of pain and show us how to love others through the love of Jesus that we might grow closer and stronger together. May the invitation we offer through living out the gospel of Jesus Christ reflect your desire to draw all people to you. We ask that you bless us and empower us in the work we do now to prepare, prepare and the work of the conference to come, that all we do will bless and give glory to your name and reveal to the world your love for all of your children. These things we ask in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Rachel, thank you so much for that beautiful prayer and for all of the reminders that you called to mind uh, for us as we walk in the way of discipleship. Thank you. Yeah, 
over um, the last week, I've been asked one question numerous times. So let me start with that question um, today. Um, it's this one. Is this session different from district orientation? And yes, it will be. Um, every district in our conference conducts uh, their orientation for um, lay and clergy members of the annual conference in their own way. If you have already attended your district conference, or your district orientation rather, um, you probably heard details about the agenda at annual conference, topics that will be covered, um, and much more. Our United Methodist Book of Discipline actually says that it's the responsibility of the Conference Board of Laity to provide for the training for lay members of the annual conference session. Traditionally, that training and orientation has often taken place during the laity session at annual conference. If you're a first time member of annual conference and unsure of your responsibilities, that seems to be a little late to me to help you prepare for the annual conference session. So in this session today, we hope to provide you with a little bit of education and maybe reduce some stress about what to expect at annual conference, offer a greater awareness about uh, life and our connection together, and build excitement for our time together in Hampton. Now, while only lay members of this year's annual conference receive the Zoom link for this orientation, all laity across the conference are welcome and encouraged to participate in this meeting. So while they may not be here with us this afternoon, please share with others in your church that the recording of the session will be on the conference website, um, uh, hopefully tomorrow, but we'll get it up as soon as we can. Now, another question that often comes from first time lay members is what's a laity session? As I shared, our laity session has often, often been focused on preparing lay members for the work of the annual conference session. We've tried to change that over the last couple of years so that we do most of the training and orientation before the laity session that's in person. We've offered an online session like this last year. We've offered some videos in advance for the past couple of years to help prepare members for the work of the annual conference. With changes to the schedule last year, we were not able to have an in-person laity session. So we offered an online session like this one, naming it the official laity session, and then had a much too short time of conversation and learning the hour before annual conference started that we called the laity heart to heart. This year, we're back to an in-person laity session, which we'll talk more about as we go through this afternoon. The Lady Heart to Heart will also be different uh, because we're not having a formal presentation like we did last year or a formal time of conversation. It's going to be a drop-in time of question and answer and getting to know each other. But we didn't want to lose the name of Lady Heart to Heart because who knows what shape it may take next year. Providing the training and orientation in advance allows us to truly make the laity session an opportunity to connect with other Virginia United Methodist laity and to hear about some of the ways that um, we as laity are making a difference in our congregation and in our community. I want to thank uh, the members of the what I'm calling the inspiration and the planning teams who helped to form and shape today's webinar session and the laity session. Uh, one of those is on screen with us, Jesse Burdett a member of the youth cohort from the Coastal Virginia District, um, Reverend Jay Carey, District Superintendent for the Living Waters District and the Cabinet Representative to the Board of Laity, Reverend Joanna Deek, Clergy Co-Director of our Certified Lay Ministry Training Initiative and Clergy Member of the Board of Laity, Eileen Friedrich, one of the Associate District Lay Leaders from Northern Virginia, Karen McElfish, Northern Virginia District Lay Leader, Diane McNaught, one of the associate district lay leaders for the Three Notch District. Jen Robinson O'Brien, lay co-director of the Certified Lay Ministry Training Initiative and the director of lay servant ministries for the Mission Rivers District. And Richard Spears, conference director of lay servant ministries. You know, it's only about a week and a half 
before we'll gather together in Hampton. <laughs> you can look at everybody's faces from sheer excitement to uh, shock. But a week and a half. As laity, we come to the role as lay members of the annual conference in a variety of ways. You might be representing your local church or charge or your district. Your service might be determined by virtue of your role on a Virginia conference or a general church board or commission. No matter how we've been chosen to serve as a lay member of this session of the Virginia Annual Conference, we share the same responsibilities to interpret the action of the Annual Conference to our congregations, to build the connection between our congregation and all of our United Methodist churches, and to connect the Church of God with people who are not yet a part of it. We carry out these responsibilities for the year we have been elected. So if by chance there has to be a call session of an annual conference, you will also be the representatives to that call session. Lay and clergy members of the annual conference all have the responsibility to ensure that we're fully prepared to participate. That means reading the book of reports in advance and any other pre-conference materials that might be available. By the way, the virtual packet of information is up on the conference website, so you can see it now, too. I hope that you've already begun to familiarize yourself with the reports and the actions in this year's book of reports. And just as a reminder, the responsibilities of lay members are on page two of the book of reports, in case you need to go back and look at it. I hope you've also taken time to watch the video report that have been uh, being made available over the last few weeks on the conference website. Do any research which would help you to understand the work of the conference. Um, something might strike you from those videos that you need to follow up on or something that you read in the book of reports. So it's your responsibility to be as prepared as you can be by asking questions before you come. And keep in mind that as we vote, all of us, lay and clergy members alike, are obligated to express views and vote as each person feels is best. Form your own opinions on issues and vote your convictions. As for the schedule, I encourage you to please participate in all the session activities, or certainly as many as you can. The schedule for this year is different from previous years. You can find the agenda on pages four and five of the book of reports. Follow the agenda and you'll be exactly where you need to be at just the right time. Now, if you are attending off-site events for breakfast or lunch, remember to give yourself enough time to travel to the convention center in time for the start of the session. Annual conference is a time to celebrate our connection as United Methodists. Take the opportunity whenever you can to greet those around you Introduce yourself, offer a friendly smile to everyone. And most of all, always remember that we are the representatives of all United Methodists as we move around the Hampton Roads area. Don't let that be a negative memory for those you interact with in restaurants and the hotels and other places that you visit. We'll share a few other reminders of the schedule as we go through this session. One other thing I want to remind you of before we get into our presentation, and that's that your responsibilities as a lay member to the annual conference do not end when Bishop Halpert Johnson calls the annual conference to a close. A major responsibility for all members of the annual conference is report back to your charge, to your church. You're the connection from your church, district, or board to the annual conference and from the annual conference back to your church district or board. You can offer that report in any way you choose, virtually, in writing, in person, as part of a worship service or some other type of gathering, in your newsletter, by whatever means works best in communicating with your congregation. The Book of Discipline does tell us the, re the report should be done no later than three months after the close of the annual conference session. Be sure to mention major issues raised or any actions that would impact your local church. 
you will find a full written summary of the, the annual conference and probably a video that I bet's gonna be created by the communications office that you can use as a part of your report once we have finished that session. Now, if you are a lay member from your charge and not the elected lay leader from your charge, schedule time to meet with your lay leader to share your experience and to communicate directly with them. And again, if you need more detail in terms of reporting, there is a reporting guide for lay members in the book of reports on pages 109 and 110. So enough of the details for the moment. Let's get to celebrating our connection. You know, this is one of the years in our quadrennial cycle, our four year cycle as United Methodists that I call um, the opportunity to learn about polity and structure in real time. It's that year when the general conference meets, the jurisdictional conference meets, and annual conference sessions meet around the world. Now, as a quick reminder, that all starts with you. You are the committed leader within your local church, faithfully participating in the life and ministries of your local congregation, meeting the needs of your local community through your prayers, presence, gift, service, and witness. But then we get into our connection. Your church is part of one of eight districts in the Virginia Conference. Your church is one of approximately 875 churches in the Virginia Annual Conference. One of 54 annual conferences in the United States and 129 annual conferences worldwide in United Methodism. The Virginia Conference is a part of the Southeastern Jurisdiction, one of five jurisdictional or regional gatherings in the United States. And as we celebrate our worldwide connection, I want us today to hear a little bit about what's happening in real time in each of those aspects of our connection together. So Warren Harper, I'm gonna start with you. Warren is previous conference lay leader in Virginia um, and in another annual conference that we won't mention right now from years ago. <laughs> but Warren uh, is the head of the lay side of our delegation to general and jurisdictional conference. Now here's another part of our tradition as we think about our polity in real time that you may or may not be aware of. With every election of a delegation, the first elected lay and clergy persons are the leads of the lay and clergy sides of the delegation. Virginia has followed a tradition, as have most annual conferences, of alternating between the first elected lay person and the first elected clergy person to chair the delegation. For this real-time general and jurisdictional conference, it's the clergy person who is the chair of the delegation. So Reverend Lindsay Freeman, we're glad you are with us. Um, but Warren, as the, the lead layperson of our delegation, um, this was not just your first general conference. This was your um, second election to the delegation from Virginia. You were elected in 2015. Um, and I know then you didn't know that you'd get to go twice to a general conference session uh, in that one four-year term. And then when the election happened in 2019, none of us knew we'd get to serve for almost five years before ever going to general conference. Um, you and Lindsay will be sharing a detailed report, I know of general conference um, at the annual conference session. But today, would you share with us a little bit about how you saw the spirit moving at general conference this year? What was different between 2016, 2019, and 2024. Definitely a difference. Um, I want to just bring us back to 2016 real quickly. Um, the title of that general conference in Portland, Oregon, was Therefore Go from Matthew 28. And I found myself sharing with five other conference lay leaders the laity address for that conference. And we found ourselves in wonderful, wonderful worship. And I have to just lift up every single general conference is full of 
area worship, people brought in from local churches to share their ministry with the general conference. So there is a very uplifting moment every single day. I must say that 2016, we were talking about leading our leaders within our churches and the need for us to stay together. Because at that time, we were trying to figure out certain things that were going on in, in our whole denomination. Nobody knew any answers. So we were asking for help. So in the 2019 Special General Conference in St. Louis, Missouri, things were pretty well divided. And I must say that there was some very hurtful language going on. Hurtful thoughts. Now, don't misunderstand me. The worship was still tremendous. It was exciting. It was loving. And we United Methodists have a way of understanding how to have conversations in love, even though we don't always agree with one another. So when we finally got to Charlotte, North Carolina, a month ago or so, the title of that general conference was, And Know That I Am God. I must say, I was part of a discipleship legislative committee. I had met with 20 individuals that I did not know on Zoom calls months and months prior to general conference. And in doing that, we became familiar with ourselves. We started asking neat questions about what made people tick and how do you express yourself? So by the time we got to general conference at Charlotte, we kind of knew one another when we hit the first week of legislative review. I must say the worship was outstanding this year, above the other two conferences that I have attended. The joy, the conversation in the hallways, a thing that was totally different this year was all seven or 800 of us had breakfast, lunch, and dinner together. We didn't have to go find restaurants outside of the hall. So that was extremely different. But what that did is it brought us all together at the meal table and allowed us to talk to the Philippine, the African, the European, and maybe the Texas and the Chicago area folk. The thing that I found extremely interesting was we found ourselves with a lot of joy, a lot of love that was going on, a feeling of transparency that I could feel honest about expressing my if I had to ask a question or ask the bishop to understand where I was coming from with regard to a uh, policy that was being discussed, no matter what level that was. But I found just the absolute joy and hope of this general conference to be absolutely outstanding. And I came home with hope 
and a feeling that the United Methodist Church was going to move forward. But it's not going to be easy because it's going to take years. And that's what we have to do next is pray for the next year or two or five together, together in love and fellowship. And that, my friends, is my feeling about the past, the present, and the future. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, Warren. Um, you did a beautiful job of summarizing that hope, I think, that all of us felt as we left Charlotte for um, the future direction of the church. And just want to remind everybody, and please jump in, Warren, and assist that um, the general conference report that yep. you and Lindsay will be offering is on the schedule for Thursday afternoon. Correct. Probably toward the end of the afternoon session. Probably pretty close to 5 p.m. or so. Yeah. I'll try to keep the laity address shorter, so uh, you'll have time to do that. Uh, but yeah, look for that. Do you want me to share the other time slots for other discussion? Please do. Okay. On Wednesday, June 19th, somewhere between 2 and 4 p.m., there's going to be an open Q&A. On Thursday, June 20th, 5.30 to 6.15 p.m., there's going to be a regionalization discussion, which was one of those items that was passed at this past general conference in Charlotte. And also on Friday, June 21st, uh, somewhere between 7.30 and 8.15, there will be another discussion on regionalization. So if you miss one, come to the other. There you are. Thank, thank you, Warren. And that time on Wednesday afternoon from 2 to 4 is the laity heart to heart. Um, Lindsay has said she'll be there with me for the whole two hours. Well, we've asked all of the um, general conference delegation and members of the Board of Laity to be there as they can during that time. So it's just going to be an open time of question and answer of conversation. So come and join us if you've got a burning question about general conference. If you want to know something about what's happening with district lay leadership activity, come join us. And we're just going to fellowship and get to know what each other. Um, as we drop in. So that should be during the time most people are registering as they get to um, to Hampton. So come and join us. Reverend Lindsay Freeman moved into that role of chair of our delegation uh, with the election of Reverend Tom Verlin to the Episcopacy, and she has done an amazing job leading us forward since November of 2022. Um, as the leads of our delegation, Lindsay and Warren, also serve as the Virginia representatives on the Southeastern Jurisdiction Committee on the Episcopacy, which makes many of the, well, not makes many, makes all of the extremely important recommendations about uh, Episcopal areas of service for our bishops, recommendations about the number of bishops that we might elect um, at a jurisdictional conference, and, and so many other things. So we know now that there will not be elections of bishops at this year's jurisdictional conference when it's held July 10th through the 12th, but there is important work that is going to be taking place in that time. Lindsay's been serving on one of the task force that uh, is extremely vital in the conversations that will happen. So Lindsay, I invite you to please share what you would like for our lay members of the annual conference to know about the upcoming jurisdictional conference, especially that space that's being made um, for this courageous conversation. Great. Thanks, Martha. Uh, good to be with y'all. I'm honored to be with you all. I, um, My ministry is enriched by uh, partnering, coming alongside lay people. And so I'm grateful for all the work that you all do across our connection and our conference. And so as Martha shared, we will not be electing bishops or we're recommending no election of bishops at this year's jurisdictional conference, which is often a primary task of this gathering. But there's still lots of business to be done. Um, much like an annual conference or a general conference, there's always a budget conversation, right? There's always space for reporting and things like that. 
But since January of 2023, I have con co-convened a, a task force around racial bias in our jurisdiction. At the November conference, uh, where we gathered for the first time, we didn't gather at the general conference, but that was kind of the first in-person gathering for uh, the jurisdictional conferences across the U.S., and there was conversation that came out of that conference to ask us to really look at and assess um, how we act as a jurisdiction and to assess our bias around race in particular. Um, I can share some resources around the history of how our jurisdictions came to be, um, but a big piece of that is around race that was happening in our country, right? And especially in our region in the Southeast. And so this task force started our conversation and worked together and specifically looked at how do we name and endorse candidates for bishop? And how do we look at um, equality and equity within our jurisdiction, particularly around race? And so over the course of six to eight months, we had some really great conversations with current Episcopal leaders, with folks who um, ran for bishop. Um, we talked to a lot of our persons of color um, around how they were endorsed in their experience of the process. Uh, we worked with the General Commission on Religion and Race um, to identify the questions we should be asking and to think about how do we bring this work back to the jurisdiction. So it's not something that like a, a vision statement sits on a shelf, but that it really is action and work for us to do. And so this, uh, this summer, uh, next month, uh, we will have conversations in a exercise called three circles. Um, and the purpose of these circles are to three things to stay in the circle or stay in the room with difference to not compare my best to your worst and to listen, okay? And so Claire Bowen, um, who has been leading these circles across our connection will walk us through that. Um, and one of our circles will be centered around the findings and the recommendations of the racial bias task force um, because this is ongoing conversation. And I'm really glad that we're not making elections this year because it gives space for us to really have conversation across delegations. That happens naturally and organically, um, but we will have two separate times to break up and have conversation together. And so I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, just some other kind of things to know is uh, different Episcopal leaders will um, preside at the different sessions. Our own Bishop Sue will lead one session. Um, and our own Bishop Tom uh, Berlin is now the president of the College uh, of the Southeast. And so he will he will preside as well. And so uh, we look forward to gathering together and hearing how we, um, as Warren shared, how do we pray for one another and walk together in this next season of what it means to be the people called United Methodist. Thanks, Martha. Oh, thank you, Lindsay. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share about the, the general conference piece or anything else happening at the annual conference related to these two next conference steps? Above. <laughs> yeah, I would just echo uh, Warren's uh, thoughts about the general conference. Um, I was not there in 2016, but from top to bottom, Charlotte was hopeful um, and inspired and just um, a rejoicing of being together, right, with our siblings across the connection. Um, and good work was done in a lot of different ways. I know we've probably heard about some of the uh, big named things, but there was a lot of um, good work happening across the board. And for annual conference, um, I would say, yeah, really network and introduce yourself and connect with one another. And um, it really is, it's not a passive thing. It is an engaging uh, with one another. So holy conferencing um, is a good thing to do. So I look forward to being with you. Thank you. Um and thanks for being the clergy representative on the group today, Lindsay. So, um, and I think it's a good time as we as we think about the resources that Lindsay said are available. If we would like to learn more about the history of, especially the Southeast jurisdiction, of our jurisdictional 
um, structure as it currently stands right now. Um, and the, the conversation around racial bias and um, just our history um, of all of that as a church and recognition of our um, our involvement in things that happened over uh, the course of so many years. It's, it's just a good time for me to remind everybody that we will be this year honoring Juneteenth and having a Juneteenth celebration service or recognition service together. Um, Wednesday night, 7 p.m. in the convention center. So I would encourage you to note that on your agenda and plan to be present. Uh, again, a way of learning about our past and our history together, especially as a church, and helping us to move forward. So. Now let's move on to the local church. We've got general conference, jurisdictional conference. Let's bring it down to the local church with hope and joy. Um, you know, in his role as director of connectional ministry, Dwayne is the resource, as I said before, with the board of laity. Um, he's passionate about new faith communities and discipleship. And I know he loved Central Virginia, which is where he was raised. Um, we had hoped today to have a representative from Appomattox Church to be with us to talk about their story of how they found themselves in um, sort of a desert without United Methodist Connection after uh, the process of disaffiliation and what has taken place since that point. But, you know, they are celebrating their relationship and connection today and Appomattox with a church picnic and worship service this afternoon. So the next best thing we could do is go back to a video piece that Hunter Brin, our conference videographer, created of their story. Um, and then who else better, no one, to share that connection than Dwayne? Um, so Dwayne, lead us in to... Uh, What's been happening with Appomattox United Methodist Church? And then share the video with us. Absolutely. Thank you, Martha. Um, we know the last year and a half, well, two years, really, um, we saw a lot of churches wrestling with whether to stay in the denomination or to leave. Um, we had about 120 churches disaffiliate uh, in Virginia uh, over the year and a half or so. Um from fall of 2022 through last year, one of those churches was a large church in Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia. And they voted to disaffiliate sometime in late February, early March of last year. And there was a very strong and willful group of folks who thought it was a bad idea. And instead of... Um, simply walking away, trying to find another church, they said, we need a presence here. And within two weeks of the disaffiliation vote in their church, they had already arranged to start worshiping in the building that was their previous church's original building in Appomattox Courthouse. They had invited a, two retired clergy to help support them. And they had 30 people at their first worship service um, two weeks after the disaffiliation, and they had about 50 on Easter that year. And um, they have since moved from that space to another space um, and are uh, in dialogue, actually, with the Presbyterian Church in the community and, and trying to discern what, what a relationship might look like there. Um, so I'll share this video with you, but it's just a beautiful story of, of folks who said, we want to be United Methodist and we want to have a United Methodist presence here and we're going to do it. Um, you know, we, we've kind of been identified as a new faith community. To see folks that really wanted to remain United Methodist because of who we are as United Methodists. First thing we did is we did a sermon series and a book study on living as United Methodist Christians. They are finding that they're blessed to be here together. 
Um, there are folks from a number of different congregations. We have people here today that hadn't been here before, uh, same way last week. Um, and I think the word is getting out to who we are. I am so happy here and I've met so many new people and I feel like I'm, I'm closer to God being here. That's not a slam on the other church because I love my former church members. I still, I love those people. It's more about God doing a new thing. And this, sometimes that process evidently feels painful, but I don't think it'll be painful forever. It doesn't feel painful anymore. It feels good. It feels God. God is so good and He gave us this place. I don't know if anybody's told you that, the history, but this is, this was an original United Methodist Church. This is where my mom went to church as a child. And so He's also given us so many people, you know, we have leaders, we have musicians, we have two wonderful pastors that are, are doing this for us. And it's really the dynamic here is that you have all these pieces, these body parts that have come together. And somehow, you know, we have drawn each other out. We have learned from each other. We have, you know, you've shared um, difficult parts of your life and, and joyous parts of your life. You just shared your life with these people. And isn't that what church is? It's the sharing and the growing and the and then coming together in worship and then going out into the community. And I feel like when I go out into the community, I not only go by myself but I go with Donna, I go with Sheila, I go with Dan, I go with the people that I'm here in church with because it feels like we're all united as one. We are truly a united Methodist church. Thank you, Dwayne. And if anybody would like to watch that video again, it's on the conference website. Uh, it's been on the Facebook page. You can find it um, and watch it. We never know what technology is going to bring for us when we uh, get started, don't do we? So you can watch it over and over again. It's such a powerful story. There's something I always hear differently each time that I listen to it. But gosh, the amazing power of laity wanting to come together as a new worshiping faith community. Who knows how many lay church planters might be out there among us, right, Dwayne? How many new faith communities might just be waiting to happen? Uh, in this new time in the life of the United Methodist Church. You know, it's when we as local church congregations get to know uh, and understand the community, get to know our neighbors and one another, when we listen to and act upon God's call in our lives that we really can transform lives and transform the world. During the laity session, that time we're going to be together at Annual Conference in Hampton, we will be reminding ourselves of the call each one of us has to ministry, um, the call of our baptism, that as lay people, we are all called to ministry. We'll recognize and serve the, and recognize and honor those lady who have responded by taking on lay supply roles, becoming certified lay ministers, and becoming commissioned as a deaconess. I've invited one of our certified lay ministers to offer her story of call and response for us today. Uh, Lauren Leggett is a member of Common Table Boulevard United Methodist Church in Richmond. She's passionate about providing safe space for those who are unhoused or who need greater support to transition to better housing situations. Lauren, thanks for being with us and thank you for sharing with us about your call to lay ministry and the work that you're doing in the greater Richmond community. Thank you so much. Um, so yes, I, I get to serve in a church that is also a little bit of a new church plant in some ways, uh, oddly enough, which is kind of exciting because it means we've also gotten to build mission and ministry around our community in Richmond. Um, I graduated from seminary two weeks ago. And one of the things that they do not tell you when you go to seminary is after you graduate, dozens of people you do not know will ask you, so when are you getting ordained? And I, I serve as a lay member of the Virginia Conference Board of Ordained Ministry. So I am uniquely familiar and aware of how important the set apart call to ordain ministry is. There are a lot of beautiful stories and a lot of great work that comes out of that. But as Martha said a moment ago, guess what? All Christians are called to ministry. So that includes all of us lay people. 
who are also called to do ministry. And one of our, um, one of the churches, United Methodist Church's teachings even says that the witness of the laity is the primary evangelistic ministry through which people will get to know Christ and will help the United Methodist Church fulfill its mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. It's also very important and very true to note that uh, the Methodist Wesleyan movement is historically lay-led. So the Wesleys empowered people to serve as lay preachers, to build communities. There's as um, there's a history in America of a deaconess movement before the modern one in which people who were lay, lay women went out and served in many missions. And these particular parts of our heritage and history really came alive for me when I was exploring my call, in part because um, I could not I could not see a world in which I was serving in a local church as an elder. I couldn't see that I was called to that. A lot of thought and prayer went into that. So I assure you that was not a lightly made uh, hasty decision of, oh, that's just scary. Um, so that's why in concurrence with my time at seminary, I also had this wonderful opportunity to participate in our annual conferences first organized uh, certified lay minister cohort. And I say that because there are several people, I think some of them are even on this call who were certified as lay ministers prior to that taking place. So we're not the first, but we are the first organized group that came through in that. And in that space, the group of us who have gotten together have had a chance to really see the different ways that lay calls can be explored. So there are folks who are serving a church from the pulpit and exhorting and preaching and organizing and administrating. There are people who are part of Fresh Expressions churches. They lead dinner church or they worship on the beach or they have a new music ministry. We have somebody who actually did a historical and genealogical project as a teaching, which is fantastic. And then there are folks like me who found their call in the community. Um, and I deeply resonate with the idea of being part of justice and mercy working out in the community. And in that I am, as a member of a community of Richmond, very, very passionate about housing. Part of that's because the city of Richmond is still uh, the second worst or says the second most evictions of people in the country that began pre-pandemic and has not stopped once the moratoriums on evictions ended in the state. Um, we also have an incredibly high rental burden in that a large portion of our community members pay over 50% of their total income to just a rent payment that does not include utilities or other costs of living because we have a lack of available affordable units. So I actually wrote my graduate thesis on that saying that uh, if you recall, John Wesley used the metaphor of a house to talk about the forms of grace that we can experience. So we're Methodists. So we would say, uh, point out very strongly that God's grace is available to all. So if the house is a metaphor for experiencing that grace, we need to invite everyone into that house. And I do take that literally in saying that uh, through the lens of like Isaiah, we offer a space to bring everyone in to safe and secure housing. I actually also sit on a board of an organization here in Richmond, Housing Families First. And our initiative, like many good housing organization initiatives these days, is built on that housing first model. We want to get people there and be part of um, be part of a restoration so that like if you are hungry, you're distracted by that. It's hard to learn. It's hard to grow. We want to make sure that people's basic needs are cared for and that they remain in stable housing. And that's kind of been the organizing principle of housing, housing groups in Richmond for a while. There's a sort of a combined total unit. And within that, I have found a space where I am trying to build faith community expressions of housing facilitation and education. So for those of us, especially in this area where this is such a prevalent problem, um, wanting to make sure that our faith communities are educated and get to do things like I was fortunate earlier this year to go to um, United Methodist Day at the General Assembly and get to talk to elected leaders about the severity and realness of these housing concerns in our state and how churches in our conference have already done some really fantastic 
fantastic work, including several who repurposed their buildings or reused them. And I want to make sure that people know that and feel that they are also empowered to use their, well, specifically, I would say use their lay status as members of the community to know that they are also called to this work of doing justice, of bringing the love of Christ into the kingdom and helping everyone know that they are welcome and important. Um, so right now I'm building out a leadership model of how to do that. Uh, two weeks since sem seminary graduation, just as a reminder, this is still a work in progress, <laughs> but I fully believe that a call to this in a lay sense also allows the opportunity to walk alongside lady and empower them from within. Um, if you're all called, we're all called. And I believe that in this role, that is part of my mission to help us all know that and share that together. Um, so I will tell you again, you're all called to ministry. <laughs> so thank you. Lauren, thank you for that reminder and for sharing just that tiny part of your story, uh, because you are exactly right. We have power as laity in every aspect of our lives to share the gospel message, to model the example of Christ, and to work alongside all of our partners, both in the um, every part of our system, every sector of society. And so thank you for that reminder. Uh, part of my call is I think I'm called to be the best lay person I can be. And I think um, that's what we need to recognize for all of us that we can use our gifts and talents in so many different places to be able to transform the world. So I want to thank uh, Rachel, Warren, Lindsay, um, Jesse, um, Lauren, did I say Lauren? I'm sorry, I'm getting confused here. And Dwayne, especially you for helping out with this uh, webinar today. I need to uh, thank all of you who have been watching with us and those who will watch the recording for uh, giving your time in celebrating our connection together and preparing for our annual conference session um, coming up very, very soon. Just as a reminder, I know we had at least one question in the Q&A uh, about timing again. Um, so Warren and Lindsay, correct me if I give false information, but the two Q&A sessions for the regionalization um, conversations with the delegates to General Conference are Thursday afternoon following the business session, so starting around 5.30, and then Friday morning at 7.30. Uh, bring your coffee, uh, whatever caffeine you need to be a part of that early morning conversation. I um, want to remind everybody again of the Juneteenth worship experience that will be Wednesday night at 7 in the Convention Center. Remind you again of the Laity Heart to Heart Q&A that is Wednesday afternoon, two to four, just whenever you can drop in and be present with us to make introductions, join in conversation and fellowship. The Laity session will start at 8.30 a.m. on, when, on um, Thursday morning, the 20th. I was almost ready to start us on Wednesday morning, but no, Thursday morning, June 20th at 8.30 we will honor and recognize, again, those who are moving into lay supply, uh, certified lay ministry and our deaconess role. And then we will receive a charge or a reminder of our mission, however you want to define that, from our three uh, keynote guests for our annual conference. So we'll hear from each one of them, Reverend Dr. Michael Beck, Reverend Dr. Rodrigo Cruz, and um, Reverend Wu Kang, who will be with us to close out the laity session. Lindsay, you can come join us if you'd like, but I know there's work to do in the clergy session. It'll be there. Um, I look forward to seeing you all in Hampton. Um, please find me and say hello. Find those of us who've been on this call if you'd like to know more about any of the stories that are there. And before I say, say a final, Goodbye. I'm going to invite another member of our youth cohort to close us in prayer. Jesse Burdett is a lay member at large from the Coastal Virginia District and a member of Craddockville United Methodist Church over on the Eastern Shore. So, Jesse, offer a closing prayer and then I'll just send us forth. All right. Would you pray with me? Lord, we pray today over this group of fired up believers, leaders, and achievers who have stepped up to your call in their lives. We pray for discernment and prayerful consideration for all these folks who have joined us today and bless those that couldn't be with us. 
We also pray over our entire annual conference. Everyone involved is vital to the growth and prosperity of the church. Our bishop, our superintendents, our lay leader, clergy and laity all play indispensable roles in the betterment of our congregations. We, th we thank you for the many ways you've blessed us and pray you continue to pour your blessings on us. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you, Jesse. Now, until we gather in Hampton, Go in peace to love and to serve as the hands, the feet, the heart of Jesus, making disciples and transforming the world as we seek to build God's kingdom on earth. See you very soon in Hampton at our annual conference session. Take care.